And so now that we know what age we're in, we know the devil's defeated. Now we can talk about what do we walk in? If that's true, what do we get to walk in? And so that's the promises and blessings of Abraham. And the cool part is me and Serge had this picked out that we're going to teach this. And then Corey's like, well, this is what I'm getting in. And when I first met Corey, this is what he loved teaching about. And I'm just going to throw out his website, Kingdom Business, Business Lifestyle. Lifestyle. His Kingdom University, their free videos, literally spend a whole video on the blessings of Abraham, the blessings of promise. So this is an important thing, foundational thing for us to start to understand. Hearing this is great, but how do we apply it to our lives? How do we take this and become better stewards, become faithful in everything that God has given us? So as we learn this, this isn't something that we say, great, I have information. What we got to do is, Lord, show me how to apply this to my life so I can manifest kingdom everywhere I go. So that's what we're excited to have Corey here to bring and teach on a passion that I've seen come out in so many podcasts in the Kingdom University. The uh, blessing of Abraham is a big, big deal. And I think that a lot of us don't realize that it's talked about in the New Testament over and over. Um, and so tonight we're going to do a study that's going to be intense and awesome. And uh, we're going to go through some powerful scriptures that's going to link from the beginning with Abraham, when God promised Abraham and God blessed Abraham. You guys remember when Abraham came out, followed the voice of God? He blessed him. And then Paul says we have this same blessing on us, right? And the same promise. So what does that mean? How many of y'all know what the promise of Abraham is? Well, we have to really, really know it and kind of like request it nicely or strongly to God. It's kind of like healing, you know. We pray and appropriate healing, but we need to also appropriate the blessing in our lives, receive it. The Bible says we ask, we seek, we knock. It, right before that scripture, it talks about the guy who went to his neighbor in the middle of the night to get some bread. And it says the, the neighbor didn't get up because he's a friend. He got up because of his persistence. And then it goes into ask, seek, and knock. And what Corey's saying is, you can pray. We all pray. But not all of us receive. But you have some people who pray, but you have other people who ask, seek, and knock. They're persistent. They go in. They won't take no for an answer. They, they want their blessing. And I think that's what's Cor what Corey's saying. And I'm going to add on to that. Is a lot of times what we call prayer is we're just hoping that he hears. They're not, if you pray from a place of knowing what is yours, you pray with a different authority. If I'm just like, man, I, I really want this and I hope that I get this, God, please bless it. That's not praying knowing what is yours. When you know what is yours, you go in with confidence. My kids know there, there are certain things they come to me, the answer is yes. They can come boldly before their dad and they know the answer. But if they don't know that we have it to provide, what do they have? Well, kind of, Dad, maybe, Dad, could we maybe do this? That's what a lot of people are praying. But when you know what is yours, when you know the authority and you know the place you have, you will ask from a different place. When you know the devil's not going to defeat you, God is my Father, I'm going to ask from a place of authority and a place where I know my God is going to take care of my needs and help me and bless me. This blessing is a big deal. It erases everything of the curse and it affects, it can affect your whole city. And uh, this is a big blessing. And so we're, and to clarify, we're talking about two specific things. The blessing, the promise, right? Genesis 12, 1 through 3. If you guys want to go there. It says, The Lord has said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household. To a land I will show you, and I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. When you believe that blessed are those who bless you, and cursed are those who curse you, it's a power that makes you feel unshakable knowing that you have the blessing of Abraham. But right now, we only know that Abraham got it, OK? 
okay? Right. But in the future, we're going to find out, here in a minute, we're going to find out that we have it. <laughs> we have this same thing that you're reading right now. Um, and that word curse, some people say, well, that's kind of mean. But it actually means anyone who has an evil intention against you, right? And so God has this put in place to protect his children. And we need to make sure that we have it alive on us. But it says, I will make your name great. A lot of people today have a hard time with that. I don't want my name to be great, only Jesus' name. But Jesus wants to make your name great so that you can make his name great. Yeah. He wants to lift you up so you can lift him up. Yeah. He, wants, he wants to lift up what Jason and Serge is doing so they can come hear about Jesus. It says, and all peoples on earth will be blessed. So just think about that because do we see that right now? All people on earth blessed? No. Nope. We don't see that right now. But, but we will. That was the promise. So Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Do you guys see this? Paul wrote this. And it's saying... Jesus hung on a pole or a cross, and some versions say, so that, this says, in order that the blessing and the promise would come on the Gentiles. And so we think he died for this reason or that reason, but how many of y'all have ever heard anyone say, Jesus died so we could have the blessing of Abraham? It's huge. Jesus wants us to have this blessing. We need this blessing. This blessing is foundation for not only our protection, Right, but also for us to bless all nations. Yeah. Um, and then that last part, guys, I want to clear up something. It says, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Most people interpret that the promise that you would get baptized in the Holy Spirit or the promise that you would get the Holy Spirit. No, it's the promise of the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord made a promise to Abraham. Okay? It's a little, I've heard it so many times where people are like, oh, we've received yeah. this spirit of promise, but it's meaning the promise of the spirit, okay? Remember, we're talking about the blessing and the promise, and in a minute, you guys are going to find out what the promise is, and it's super big, <laughs> okay. all right? If we are sons of Abraham, there's an inheritance, there's a promise on us, there's a blessing on us, and we need to know what God wants to activate in our lives. Okay, so it says, if you, are, if you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. A lot of people today will say, well, you know, the old covenant, that's for the past. We don't need to read that. Well, this wasn't, when God was talking to Abraham, that was before the law, right? That was based on Abraham's faith in in. Paul's saying that that stuff's on us. Paul's saying that we are Abraham's seed. So it's very important that we understand the life of Abraham. Yeah. I'll give a little pretext to Genesis 22, but if you want to really go in depth later on, guys, when you get home or tomorrow, read Genesis 22, the whole chapter. This chapter is about when he, God said, offer your son Isaac as a sacrifice. Right? And he went up to the mountain went to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice, God had the knife up and everything, and then all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord says, stop, right? And there was a ram in the thicket, and on the mountain of the Lord, the Lord will provide. Stop sermon. Right? That's where everybody stops. How many of y'all ever heard past that part preached? Because it doesn't fit with other theologies, what we're about to read. Because, let's go ahead and read that. You want yeah. to read it? And said, I swear by myself. Okay, hold on. And said, so an angel, we're missing part of that. It says, and an angel of the Lord appeared to Abraham a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the skies and as the sand on, on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies 
And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. I used to be able to relate more to the curses that he said that Jesus ripped from us. Like he nullified the curse. He took those curses away. I used to relate more to those curses than I did the blessings. I remember reading those curses going, man, this is my life. But I didn't know that I had a blessing. And that's, that was the first time I ever looked into the blessing. And when you look into the blessing and even the promises that were promised to Abraham, it's like, wow, I didn't even know that was available to me. And I think that's where we're coming to you with this. Everybody talks about the blessings of Abraham. Everybody talks about the blessings of God. But, but how do we define that? What are they? It's huge because it'll change the direction of your life. It, it, it takes us from the curses and it re- makes us realize that doesn't belong to us. This belongs to me. How do I get these? And that's what we're getting ready to walk into. How do we obtain this inheritance? And first of all, it's through Jesus. Yeah, that's, that's what's good is we're not just going to show you the blessing. We're going to show you how to get it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Because God doesn't want you oblivious as to how to get what his son paid for. He wants you to have this blessing. But I want to point out something real quick. Everybody look. Your descendants will take possession of the cities. I have to like shout this because I've been trying to teach for this for 10 years. (laughs) They will take possession of the cities of their enemies. So I want to point out to you that the gospel of the kingdom involves taking possession of cities. Yes. God's, and I'm going to prove that. And, and you probably it will never be the same because we've limited the gospel to, you know, praying on the streets, evangelism. But God needs us to take possession of the cities of our enemies, right? He wants us in charge of the cities. And why? Because, you know, the mayors are a gatekeeper, over the city. Is it okay, mayors, that we do this stuff? They have to get approval from the mayors. Mayors are in charge of cities. So, and it says your descendants. Whose descendants? Abraham's, right? Who's Abraham's descendants? It says if you are in Christ, you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Good job. So it says in blessings, I will bless you. But that's where we always stop. Hmm. And I'm guilty of this too. Because I'm always looking to be blessed. It's always on me. It always stops with me. And I talk to a lot of people through the week, and that's what we're always focused in on is blessing me. And blessing, I will bless you. And then we stop right there. But like I said before service, he wants to take us from always looking to be blessed to how can I be a blessing? You're supposed to be a blessing to the nations. I'm supposed to to take the cities of my enemies. That goes beyond me. That's not only me being blessed, but that's me blessing. And I think for so long, the church has been to the spot where it's about me and I'm calling in my Mercedes and I'm calling in my big house and then it just stops right there. But now we're starting to see people who are like, how can I take what I've been given and change the literal world with it? How can we start transforming this world and making it look like heaven? That's me being a blessing to the nations. Yeah, how can we take possession of our inheritance? And so what we're seeing here is that, you know, we have, we have a, a promise on us. This promise is on us. God swore by his own self that the descendants of Abraham would do this, right? So these cities are ours. <laughs> um, and if you know that you have power to take possession of the cities of your enemies and you know that Blessed are those who bless you and cursed are those who curse you. What can come your way and cause you problems? Nothing. What can hurt you? Nothing. That, that's ammo that puts you above everything. Every evil force on this, on this earth. It puts evil underneath you in every single way. I mean, there's a scripture that says we're seated where? Far above. Yeah. Far above. We're not below. We're far above. Who was it we were talking about said literally for him to become the mayor of the city was a downgrade from the position he had. Yeah. No, there has been people in the past, men of God, men of God that, mm-hmm. um, you know, they've been asked to be president. And they said, no, I don't want to step down to that position because the people 
respected that man of God's, you know, decisions, what he said, more than the president of that country. And uh, that's pretty powerful. You guys can look him up if you want. So if we're seated far above and we do fill those positions, we're still reigning from a place above, even though we're holding a natural title. We don't want to not fill those positions, but we got to know our authority never comes from that title. When we have people, righteous men and women, running for these positions, we want them to know that they're above that position. And they're ruling from a heavenly place, though they have an earthly title. Yeah, and the word says cities, right? And in Luke 19 parable of the stewards we're going to talk about city jesus talks about cities also we're, we'll get there but what i want to say is the the real hebrew word is gates all right and if you study gates back in that time they had their city surrounded by fortified walls and they had a place where the judges sat and it was the highest place of authority in the land and the judges decided what would go on inside of their territory how they would trade with others so it was the ju the judicial branch, if you will, the judges. And who has the most power, really? And judges can stop what the president's trying to do, right? Mm -hmm. So, and we've seen that. So this is saying, take over the positions of highest power in the earth. <laughs> God's children, the descendants of Abraham, will take possession. He swore it by his own self. So people say, well, why don't we see that? Well, you got to have it preached to hear it and then believe it. We got to believe this. So it's, it's not just like, oh, yeah, that's a, a good sermon. Like, if we go home and choose to believe this and say, Father, um, I'm a descendant of Abraham. I want to take possession of cities. Right? That's a big prayer. <laughs> yeah. It's a big prayer to pray, but we can do it. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God will justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham, all nations will be blessed through you. Right. You know, a lot of times we hear these doom and gloom ideas, which doesn't tie into that, right? If we were to ask 10 people what, you know, what is the gospel, would, would any of them say all, that all nations would be blessed? Probably not. But that's what the Bible says. You see, we have so many man's ideas we need to know what the Bible says the gospel is, right? And most, most times the gospel message that we hear has nothing to do with Abraham. We, and we think he's irrelevant because he's in the past, but Paul didn't say so. He said, understand then, understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. <clears throat> God announced the gospel in advance, saying all nations will be blessed. So all nations are being blessed because heaven is invading and God's children are to take over. Yeah, it says when a righteous man is in power or in authority or, or over something, the people rejoice. Yep. They rejoice when we, when righteous are, are, are in power. And if you think about it, dissect it the way I like to dissect it. He's given us power. He's given us that authority. So when I take that place, I'm in power. Even over the territory you're given or even in Tulsa, but people rejoice when they see righteous men taking their place. Yeah, it's a strange thing to think that God's children shouldn't be in charge of the earth. Right? That's strange. But people say it's strange when we say that God's people are supposed to be in charge. Like, yeah. of course God wants his children in charge. But it's funny that we have to teach all this to, yeah. to like, prove it. You yeah. know? If I tell kids this, they're like, yeah, Sure, you know, <laughs> but you tell like people who've been through church for a while, they're like, I don't know about that if God really wants his people in charge. Right. <laughs> That's weird. So right. the book of Psalms says that the righteous will never be removed, hmm. but, but the, the wicked. wicked will. <laughs> yeah. But we, we think of it as opposite, but it says the wicked will be removed, but the righteous will never be shaken, will never be removed. The, the word says wherever my foot lands is mine. Wherever my foot treads is mine. The word says that it, in Psalms that the meek inherit the earth. It says in Matthew, as I don't know if we've gotten there yet, that the meek inherit the earth. Over and over again, the earth is given to the righteous. From the very beginning, Adam was a righteous man. And he gave him dominion over the earth. So the earth belongs to us. Yeah, we got to get that in our spirit. This earth is our inheritance. Yes, it's our inheritance. Who are these uncircumcised Philistines? Right. 
right? We can, we can have that because this is our earth. Who are these people that don't know God trying to tell us what to do? I want to impart that into y'all's spirit. That's what I'm hoping to do. All right, Luke 19. You guys got your Bibles? 11 through 27, the parable of the ten minas. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable. Because he was near Jerusalem, it's Jesus talking, he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. So Jesus is about to speak something to correct, the NLT version says, to correct their way of thinking about how the kingdom was to come, something to that effect. But they thought the kingdom was going to show up at once, so Jesus then spoke this parable. So that means this parable is going to teach you how the kingdom manifests. Get it? Who gets what I'm saying? Yeah? Okay. It's a big deal. This is one of the most important parts of the Bible because Jesus lays it out. Um, and this says, He said, a, noble, or a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minas. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money in order to find out what they had gained with it. The first one came and said, Sir, your mina earned ten, has earned ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. Okay, I didn't make that up. <laughs> it's really in there, and we've really been skipping over it. Because maybe it's too big, I don't want to run a city, I don't want to be in charge, that doesn't sound like me. But guys... We have to start thinking bigger about dominion, all right, in, in relationship with God, because if we don't, guess who is? <laughs> the ones who don't know God. They're like, well, I'll take that spot then. If the church is waiting on the end of the planet, then I might as well take that spot. And why are they leading? There could be many reasons why they're leading. Maybe they want to do some good, but can they withstand spiritual attacks? No. Only those who, you know, give their life to Jesus have this authority over all the powers of the enemy. Maybe they want to lead for greed's sake. Maybe they want to corrupt the education. Who knows? But we got to stop thinking about ourselves and what we don't like or do like and realize what the Bible says that we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be wise stewards and take, you know, in the Spanish version it says, take government. Take government of ten cities. So we, we like to talk about our inheritance in Christ, but what I always ask people, what are you talking about? What is it? Oh, peace and joy and love and things like that. But this says our inheritance is the earth. And if you look that up in the Greek, it means earth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Acts 3, 19 through 26. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for, the, for God to restore everything. As he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, the Lord your God will rise up for you, a prophet like me, from among your own people. Listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who had spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all people on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him, forth, or sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. Yeah, so that's when Peter first preached to the onlookers that had basically nailed Jesus to the cross. He said, he said, repent so that your sins may be blotted out. And then verse 25, look at it, guys. It says, and you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made 
with your fathers, he said to Abraham, through your offspring, all people on earth will be blessed. Right? So how do all the people on earth get blessed? People say, well, I've had people tell me this. Yeah, all people on earth are already blessed because they can now know Jesus. Sounds nice, but it's not what that's talking about. It was talking about through your offspring, all people, through the descendants of Abraham, those who have the faith of Abraham possessing cities and liberating the people, liberating creation. This one, Romans 4, 13, 16, clearly God's promises to give the whole earth to Abraham. That's something you don't hear much. God's promises to give the whole entire earth to Abraham, except in the last days is what we say. That don't make sense. God promises to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. If God's promise is only for those who obey the law, then faith is not necessary and the promise is pointless. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. So the promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift, and we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses. If we have faith like Abraham's, for Abraham is the father of all who believe. So let's go back. Let's discuss this real quick. That's powerful. <laughs> yeah, so this is the NLT version. If you lo I looked this up in the Greek a lot, and the NLT nails it better than the other versions that I've read. But it says, because if you read it in the other versions, it's like all mysterious sounding, you can't really understand it. But it says, clear, this is Paul. <laughs> he says, clearly God's promise to give the whole earth... <laughs> to Abraham and his descendants was not based on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship based on faith, right? And then it says, down here, check it out. It says, it is given as a free gift, and we're all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if, huh, there's the if, and we're going to talk about this in just a second, if we have faith like Abraham's, Okay, so we've been discussing this. Kenneth Hagin talked about this. There's two types of faith. Well, there's probably many, but the two that I want to mention is there's the Thomas faith, has to see it before he believes it, and then there's the Abraham faith, left everything to follow the voice of the Lord. Not, oh, I need my prophet friend to come over. I need five more people to make sure <laughs> that I heard correctly. I need to pray about it for five weeks or whatever. I need to see the holes in the hand, okay? Mm -hmm. So there's two types of faith, and if we have the, <laughs> the Thomas type of faith, that's not the faith that activates this promise. It's not the faith that activates the blessing. We have to have faith like Abraham. And Jesus, didn't he test people like that? Leave everything behind, follow me. You guys remember Zacchaeus, right? He climbed up in the tree. I don't know if you guys ever thought this, but let's go to Luke 19. I'm going to... Have Sorry. any of the ladies had your husband come home and be like, hey, pack your bags, we're going somewhere? <laughs> <laughs> but that's what he's saying. It's the, it's the type that's like, no, I need to know where we're going. No, yeah. just pack your bags, put a bathing suit in, put a coat on, huh. put them both in there. We're going on a trip. It's kind of exciting, though. And you trust your husband, so you know it's going to be a good spot. Should be. Yeah. <laughs> or, or like your kids, right? They always jump in the car with yeah. you, right? right? Yeah, they'll jump. Yeah, exactly. Like I'd be kid, like, Asher, let's go. He's like, all right. Yeah. He doesn't need anything. That's just... the kind of faith we want. And the cool part is, if you're like, man, I might have Thomas faith right now. God's going to work with you to bring you to a place where you can have faith without seeing. Because Thomas... He saw, and after that, he went and he became very integral in the Gospels, hitting, reaching to the ends of the earth at that time. Mm -hmm. At that time, Thomas was, after that point, became very influential in taking the Gospel out to the world. So just because you might start with, Lord, I got to see something, 
Just allow the Lord to stretch you, to grow you, mm -hmm. so that you can be like Abraham. Nice. Good point. Good point. Yeah, because yeah. people may be thinking that any time you can decide to give God your all and to choose to do His yeah. will. Luke 19.1 is where we're at. It says, He entered Jericho and was passing through it, and a man there named Zacchaeus, and a man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not, because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him, because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything... I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out that which was lost. Very interesting, right? Was Jesus looking for those who have faith, the faith of Abraham? He was, right? In this next part, we're going to prove it too. Jesus wants to know if we can have this faith, if we can lay down our life for Him all the way. And when we do, it's a glorious thing because we find out that His will is way better than what we could come up with. And uh, after we lay down our life, then He starts saying, hey, what do you want to do? What type of things do you desire to do? Because He's a Father. But He needs to know that we can trust him, that we will trust Him with our life. Now, I want to say something about that, giving your life fully. Because what we have, as some of you guys have heard me say, what we have is a marriage covenant with Christ. It's a marriage covenant. But in, in us giving our whole life, He gives His whole life. It's mutual. It's a, it's a molding of the two. It's becoming one. We always focus on all that we give up. Us giving everything, but it's actually, it goes both ways. All right, so at this point, you know, some, I like to talk about the blessing, right? The blessing of Abraham. Well, if you remember, Abraham grew exceedingly wealthy in livestock, gold, and silver. Not dollar bills, <laughs> okay? People think dollar bills are wealth, but in the Bible, it talks about, like, even food as well, like, remember that servant that went out to get all, collect all for the, the owner? And they, owned, they owed different amounts of food, bushels of food, right? And so they used currency differently. They thought about wealth differently. And I've taught about how we're supposed to increase in wealth in those areas. And then someone will like to chime in and say, what about the rich young ruler? It's impossible to go through the eye of the needle and be rich and get into the kingdom and all this stuff. I say, okay, we need to go through that because the rich young ruler story, again, just like the story of Abraham, they stop at the ram and there's a whole other part. The rich young ruler, they stop at the camel in the eye of the needle and they never read what Peter said after that. And so today we're going to read this one and it's going to make more sense that we are supposed to be wealthy in the kingdom. Well, let's just read it and then we'll talk about it. Mark 10, guess, 17 through 31. Sorry. <laughs> As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal, inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is, a, is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mo mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this time, or at this, the man's face fell. 
He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? The disciple, disciples were amu- amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Then Peter spoke up, We have left everything to follow you. Truly I tell you, Jesus replied, No one who has left home or brother or sister or mother or father or child or fields for me and the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brother, sister, mother, children, and fields along with persecution, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. I love how that last line's in there. It's, it kind of throws people off, and then they're trying to figure that part out. How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom. All right? So, in, in this guy, Jesus asked to give everything, but Zacchaeus said half, Right? So some people think like there's a certain amount that you have to give. You have to give everything, and if you miss anything, then maybe you didn't get it. Um, But it's about the heart, right? Do you value the will of God over your own will, right? Will you give what Jesus requires of you? And he may ask different things to everyone, but is his will first place in your life is a good way to check. Um, and, and we have to know God's will. And, and that's really what we're learning too tonight. We're learning that God's will is that His children be in charge of the earth. So are we taking steps in that direction? That's how we keep the kingdom first. Are we taking steps in making this world a better place, in taking ground, possessing our inheritance? We need to be taking steps in that direction. Um, so it's hard for rich to enter, but... Once they enter, Peter was entered, right? So Peter chimes in, and this is the part that most people don't realize. Peter spoke up, and you can imagine Peter like, what about us? Like, we did what that guy couldn't do. What's going to happen? And uh, Jesus said that no one who has left home or brothers or sister or mother or father or children or fields for me and the gospel, right? That's what Abraham did. He left everything for the gospel, right? Or to follow for the gospel because he announced the gospel to him. So he left hearing the voice of the Lord, not knowing where he was really going to go, but he knew it was the voice of the Lord. So he followed it. And God blessed him. And guess what? So in the church, if people do get to this, like there's a lot of movements, Word of Faith movement, like, you know, different movements out there, they're like, I declare the hundredfold blessing is mine, right? Is that what they say? Yep. Yeah, so no offense, the word, word of faith move, I learned a lot. But it's not called the hundredfold blessing. It's called the blessing of Abraham. So this is the blessing of Abraham, and this is how you obtain it. You leave everything to follow Jesus. Lay down your life. So I got so much rolling around, and I don't... Preach it. Well, here's what I see. Like, what stops us from stepping into the inheritance? What stops you? Like, everything that stops us from stepping into what, to our blessing that we inherit, that is freely given, what stops us? Everything that stops us, every excuse you have has been taken away. There's an answer for it. Everything. I'm not worthy. No, he took care of that. It's not by that. You don't have to live by the law. It doesn't matter. Oh, it doesn't matter if you messed up. It's by faith. It's by relationship is basically what Corey's saying. By Jesus and His yeah. righteousness. So I have Lena lives in my house. She screws up. Do I stop blessing her because she screwed up? No. She's a daughter. She's the daughter of the Father. She gets blessed regardless. I want the best for her. We'll fix the mess up, but you're blessed anyway. For her to... Reject that? It, it, she can do it. She can reject my help. She can reject my blessing. 
But that would be on her, not on me. I'm not the one stopping it. I would never stop that. But any excuse we have, I don't have what it takes to, to be blessed or to be a blessing to the nation. No, he gives you everything for life and godliness. There's not one excuse that we have not to be walking in blessing, except for, you know, you don't know it, but now we know it. Now we know what the blessings are. Now we know we can walk into it. So I guess what, what's rolling around in me is, what is God calling you to right now? What is he calling you to step into right now? There's absolutely nothing that stands in the way but you. That's it. He, there's no blocks on his end. It's all on us. What stops you? What call do you have? If it's just to go to work and clock in and clock out, you're missing it. Because even as a little kid, man, our dreams are huge. But as we get older, it seems like they get smaller. But they're supposed to be getting bigger. They're supposed to be getting to the point where he promised Abraham the whole world. He promises us the entire earth. Our imagination should be bigger now than it went, when it was when we were a kid. Now it should encompass the whole earth. Yeah. He promises that to us. What's stopping us from stepping into that? What's stopping you? And I know it's a process. Everybody has a process. Christy's got some things. We all have vision that we're trying to attain. But to get from here to here, I know we talk about a lot. How I'll meet people who have all these dreams. And I'll see them 20 years later and they still have the same dreams. Not one step further. Same stories. But they've never moved on. They've never stepped into closer to what God has for them. And it's because of them. I know I could speak to that because of me. I've been like that many times, many ways in my life. But I'm at the point now, it's like, man, I don't want no more hangups. No more hangups. I'll go back to a big one. A big hangup for me was that he would make my name great. <laughs> That's one of the blessings of Abraham, to make your name great, to where Nikki's name is great. Oh, I don't want to take the glory. You're not looking for the glory. I am blessed when Lena gets attention. I'm blessed when people see her as influential. When we get blessed, when our name is great, it exalts the Father. It brings glory to the Father. What, what dad wouldn't be proud of that? Or what mom. mom wouldn't be proud of that? Yeah. <laughs> That's ridiculous. We've come up with these things and they're hang-ups, and you've heard me say that word a lot, they're hang-ups, and that's exactly what they do, man. They keep me hung up. I can't move forward. I can't grow. I can't step into fully what God has for me because I don't think I'm worthy enough. Or, well, I'm not, I'm not a Bill Gates. You know what I mean? What's stopping you? Man, there's absolutely no limits to the height that we can go to. None at all. None. And you've seen it. To the point where we could be influencing the entire earth. Can you think of yourself influencing the entire earth? Can you see that, Josiah? Yeah. Why not? He says we can. He says we can be a light. blessing to the entire uh, earth. Why can't we? Soon. Why can't You're we see ourselves light. that way? Like we got to start taking care of those things. And getting those things away that stop us from, from seeing ourselves to be able to do that. You know what I mean? I want to, it's funny, the messages we did before we started the kingdom was the love of the Father. And if you look at Genesis, Adam and Eve, when they sinned, God still showed up in the garden where he met them every day. It was, this, it was us that hid. Think, as most of us are parents, what happens when your kids get, do something wrong? Do they come up and say, man, I screwed up, Dad? No, they go hide, yeah. just like Adam and Eve did. What happened with the prodigal son? The, he said, I want my inheritance. And the father said, here, take it. And he went and he blew it. And he ended up in a pig pen. And he goes, I'll at least go to the father and I'll be a slave. But the interesting thing is, the whole time the son was gone, and he wasn't doing what the father hoped, because of, the father was still what? He was still looking for his son to come home. He was still looking, say, the way he went, he was looking for him. Because when the son came back, what did he say? The father saw him far off. 
The father never stopped hoping, never stopped loving, never stopped believing that I was coming. Man, when you mess up, go back to the father and say, man, I forgive. Because as soon as the fa- father seen him, the father ran. And the son had his whole speech. How many times have your kids came to you? They have their speech of, I'm sorry, made out. What did the father do? He immediately said, I don't care. Get the robe. We're having a feast. And so if our hang-ups, we don't understand the love of the father, we got to get that right so we can step into the blessings and promise of Abraham. I've had people tell me, Corey, I don't feel worthy to possess the land like you do. And I'm like, well, it's not about how we feel, you know. Um, It's about Jesus died and uh, we're in him and God sees him. When he looks at us, he sees his righteousness, not our faults. And so you may mess up, but God's more worried about his promise to Abraham than he is about your mess ups. And he wants us to possess the earth, even if you have faults or problems, as long as you're not trying to destroy the planet, like you're going to do better than a lot of these people that are trying to lead the planet. People tell me, Corey, I don't think I'm qualified to be in charge of a city. Well, get qualified, right? It's not that hard. I was telling somebody the other day, and we're talking about, you know, the kingdom government coming on earth. We got to build new structures and things like that. So that's a lot to think about. He said, no, it's not. I was like, whoa, (laughs) I need to hang out with you a little bit more. But to him, he had this way of thinking that, man, everything is possible. If other people can think about these things, so can we. And I just want to encourage you guys that... If you love God, and you love this world, and you want to make it a better place, you're on the right track. Take bigger steps. Think bigger. Think globally, right? I remember before I came here, I tried to think locally and see if I could live with just a local mindset, you know, in Nicaragua. But no, I, I, something has happened to where I want to see all the nations blessed. I want to see God's children in charge, you know? And the Bible says that the creation is waiting with eager expectation for the manifestation of the sons of God so that it can be liberated. We're not waiting on Jesus. Creation is waiting on the sons with an S. It's waiting on us. Yeah. So I want to I do something. I want everybody to stand up. We're going to do, a, a, you could call it a prophetic act. So I want everybody to close their eyes. And this is a time with you and the Father, right? This is a time where I think most, most everybody in here that I know of, that I've spoken to, has dreams, has visions, has something they're called to do, something they know God wants them to work towards, right? So what are those hang-ups? What are those things that stop you? What are those things in your mind that stop you from stepping into what God's called you to, to, to start stepping into. What's keeping your feet in place? That's what I want you to stick in your hands. What mindsets? What excuses you have? Whatever it is, what is it that is holding you back? Jesus paid the price for every single one of those. He's got an answer for every single one of those. What's stopping you? What's making you feel unworthy? What's making you feel like you don't have enough? You don't have the right resources? And with those things in your hands, just in your mind, I want you to make a commitment to the Lord. Just speak to the Lord. Just make a commitment. I'm getting rid of these things. I want you to help me with these things. I don't want these things holding me back anymore. I'm all in. I want to step into the call you've called me to, the things you've called me to do, big and small. And these hang-ups that lay right here, Lord, I give them to you. Every single one of those, Lord, we give those to you right now. God, I thank you that you call us your children, that you called us to purpose, you have intent, you called us to be in life union with you, to do life together with you. It's the way you created us to be. It's not by my works of the law, trying to be good so that I can attain all this. You've just freely given it. Matter of fact, you sent your son 
because I couldn't live that way. And now it comes by relationship. So in our relationship with you, Father, we give you these things. We ask that you root these out of us. We renew our mind according to your word. Lord, we line our wills up with your wills. We line our emotions up with your emotions. And your word says to seek the Lord continually. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek the Lord continually. So we, Lord, we seek your strength to move past these hang-ups and to step into what you've called us to step into. To get our minds off of always trying to be blessed, but also to be a blessing to this world. And God, I ask for those who don't know what their next step is, what you're calling them to do, God, I pray that you implant vision into them right now. Those things that block whatever you have for them, I call those things to be gone right now in Jesus' name. We break those things. God, I thank you for a flood of revelation. I thank you for a flood of wisdom. I thank you for a flood of vision into every one of our lives in this room in Jesus' name. A flood of vision. A flood of purpose. Revelation and insight to that inheritance that you have called us to live in. The blessings and the promises of Abraham. God, we release vision in this place. We release vision in this place. So guys, I just have one last thing that I put up here. Um, yeah, it's just a declaration, okay? So it says the blessing and promise come by faith, right? And faith speaks. So let's do a declaration. Let's speak that we have the blessing. We have the promise, right? So let's all just, we can just say it together. I have, I have the blessing and the promise of Abraham in Jesus' name. Let's do it one more time. I have the blessing and the promise of Abraham in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I would say con declare that every day. Every day, yeah. Every day. Do I it for that. the next week. Commit it for the next week. Jason asked me one time, how long did it take for it to start activating in your life? Remember? And I, 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 said, for, I said, two years. I walked around saying that almost every day. But uh, it was growing every day. But then eventually I really, really started to become familiar with the blessing and how it goes before us. It's kind of cool because I, I remember learning about the blessing and I had my day planned out. And then something else came up and I was thinking, oh, wait. I wonder if the blessing is over there. <laughs> I was like, I was supposed to go here, you know. And then the Lord's like, the blessing goes everywhere you go. And it goes before you. It goes behind you. It's, it's a powerful thing. <laughs> and it allows us to rise up to the highest positions on the earth. If we'll let it. If we'll let it and not be afraid. Yeah? Because I'm telling you, these evil ones out there, they're not afraid to take over and and corrupt these systems. We have to rise up and not be afraid. So let this seed go deep in you, Father. I pray that this seed, this blessing, this promise, this seed would not be rooted out and that this seed would grow. The kingdom message would grow in their hearts. The dominion would grow and they would take possession of their inheritance. That we would all take possession of our inheritance as your children, as descendants of Abraham. We have the faith of Abraham, and we believe. That's the thing. That's the key. we got to believe God's promise. Even though we don't see it all the time, maybe it looks bad out, but we believe that all nations will be blessed. That's the gospel. That all nations will be blessed. We have to believe that, right? And we have to take steps of faith. The smallest steps of faith will make a huge difference in your city, in your life, in this world. But we have to be taking some sort of steps of faith. The righteous live by faith. So whatever it is that God's speaking to you is going to involve taking a step of faith. For all of us to have kids, and, and I just even if you don't, if you're a kid or a youth or a teenager, all of you, if you have something for your kids and they don't take part of it, it breaks your heart. Literally, God says, I have all of this. And... 
there's times that I've wept like, man, when, when your kids are walking through stuff and you're like, literally, I had this with my, one of my kids this week. I'm like, I don't want you to suffer through what I did. Like, there's a way to learn. And what I'm giving you, this wisdom is an inheritance. I went through junk. Most of the adults here went through junk. And when we have our kids, we go, please, listen. It breaks your heart as a parent when you're like, here's wisdom. It's more valuable than gold. And that's inheritance. It's part of the inheritance. Is if you follow, you're not going to have to suffer what I did. And if my kids suffer less than I do, my grandkids suffer less than they did. And it breaks your heart as a parent to say, here's an inheritance. I learned it the stupid, the hard way. Learn from me. Don't go do it. The blessings, the promise, everything. Don't go figure it out yourself. They're there. And God's heart breaks a lot when we say, but no, I, I still, I'm still not worthy. No, you are worthy. You are capable. You are everything that you need to be to do what God says. And he weeps over his children when they don't live what he calls to. I know he's wept over me because I haven't lived the way I'm supposed to in areas. There's areas right now I'm still like, Lord, I know I'm called. I know in my, the word, I know in my mind and I know in my heart, I'm to live better in this area than I am. Lord, help me. And he weeps over us not living in his promises. And he's like, let me show you. This is what tonight is. Let me show you what is your inheritance. And let me show you how to walk in it. It's Jesus. And we want to walk in it. And he wants us and he wants to rejoice with us when we walk into the blessings and the promises and everything that he's given us.